Welcome to Whistle Where You Work, where we'll be talking today with legal and psychological experts about the employer practice of stifling dissent by ordering employees to be tested for mental disorders. But first, we're all familiar with military chains of command. That's an order. Brooks, no dissent. Well, not quite. A legal order, Brooks, no dissent. But that's a distinction that's apparently been lost on some quasi-military organizations like the D.C. Fire Department. With me are three D.C. firefighters who blew the whistle. Captain Vanessa Coleman, former General Counsel Teresa Cusick, and fire investigator Gerald Pennington. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. And we're going to start with you, Captain Coleman. And I should say that none of the firefighters present are speaking on behalf of the D.C. Fire Department. We're going to learn a little bit about your stories. Um, tell me, when did you first join the D.C. Fire Department? In March of 1990. And you rose from the ranks, through the ranks, from a cadet to captain? That is correct. And uh, during that period of time, did you have good performance evaluations? Absolutely. Yes. Um, all right. Now, we're going to go right to a fire that occurred uh, on March 12, 2008, in the Mount Pleasant section of District of Columbia. Tell me what happened there. Uh, there was a multi-alarm uh, fire in which there was an operational error that I was wrongly blamed for. Um, Tell me what happened. Uh, there was a fire which had originated in the basement, and it was initially my uh, duty assignment to check the basement with my crew uh, prior to going to any other part of the building. And before I could make it to the basement, I was given a um, subsequent order uh, to go to the third floor. And so I rapidly took that order and I went to the third floor. This was before you were able to determine the source of the fire. Right. And we did not know at that time that the fire was in the basement. It was assumed that it was on the second floor. So my commander, the chief commander of the fire ground, told me to go to the third floor, and so I quickly went to the third floor, and then moments later, we found out that the fire was actually brewing in the basement. And so by the time they could send other companies down, the fire got out of control, and the building, most of the building burned down and was destroyed, and they attempted to blame me uh, for not going to the basement. But there was a radio transmission that suggested otherwise? That's correct. And they did not heed or they didn't want to acknowledge the operational error. Engine 21, your location now. We're in the second floor, Chief. 21 on the second floor. We're entering the second floor. Copy. Men, stretch your line to the number three floor. I want you above the fire, okay? <laughs> 21, copy. You were concerned uh, enough about uh, efforts to scapegoat you for the problems here that you wrote a memo on April 1st, 2008. Um, and tell me about that. Uh, I tried to express to my superiors, including the fire chief, um, what had actually happened. And that was um, marked by the tape, but they didn't want to... Um, they didn't want to heat it. They didn't want to acknowledge it. The tape, it. you're saying the radio transmission. That's correct. That showed that you were ordered up to the third floor. And I obeyed my superior's commandments. And uh, they still wanted to try to blame me for the fire error. Okay. On July 14th of 2008, you were removed as captain at your engine house and transferred. Uh, what were the duties that you were now assigned to? Uh, currently, I have no duties. Well, back then, I'm sorry. Uh, back first, then, yeah. I was a company commander. I commanded uh, the other three shifts, and I was also the commander of my shift um, in the firehouse. Okay, then you got transferred? To what they call uh, facilities, warehouse, and initially they uh, made on paper that I was supposed to be dealing with some projects, which was a purpose for my detail, but ever since I've been there, I haven't been given a, a legitimate work assignment. But two weeks after you were transferred there, you did get an assignment. You were assigned to go uh, to be <laughs> to tested. To take a psych test. To take a, a psych test. Tell That's me about correct. that. Um, for no apparent reason, a uh, legitimate reason, I was ordered uh, by uh, someone within my chain of command to go and take a psych test because um, they were concerned because of some of the formal written complaints that I had made uh, about my superiors, uh, the impropriety, 
uh, discrimination and not supporting me as a company commander. So because you were making complaints, you must be crazy. Pretty much, yes. Okay. And on January 13th, 2009, you were threatened with termination for challenging the order that you actually appear for the fitness for duty test. Is that right? That's correct. Um, I had raised some concerns about the waiver form that you had to sign prior to taking the test. And although it gave me the right to raise concerns about it, um, you know, I was penalized for raising concerns. And of course, I didn't sign the form until I had uh, counsel uh, and representation. But, you know, again, to them, it looked as though I was being insubordinate. Mm -hmm. And they charged me accordingly. And so then you were, you signed the waiver with the advice of counsel? I, ultimately, I signed and um, I tried to comply as they were ordering me to do, you know, knowing that I would be facing uh, disciplinary charges if I didn't. And um, ultimately, what I had is one of the, the psychiatrists who was supposed to have been testing me, uh, when she heard my story and got my, um, you know, the reason why I was taking the test, which was pretty much, again, that I was being ordered, and if I didn't comply, I would face disciplinary charges, she immediately saw that as being uh, against her ethical um, duties to still issue me the test. So she stopped the testing at that point, and ultimately they, they found a way to write me up for that, <laughs> for the decision that the psychiatrist made. Well, uh, it's bad, and we're going to hear stories that make it even worse. We're going to move on now to Teresa Cusick, who was the general counsel at the D.C. Fire Department between 1998 and 2007. Uh, and in that capacity, you were in the senior legal services, grade 15, uh, pretty handsome salary, over $120,000 a year. They must have liked you, huh? I thought so. <laughs> Describe your duties then. Well, first let me say, so I don't offend with the real firefighters, that I'm a civilian yeah. and not a firefighter. Gotcha. Um, my duties were pretty extensive. It was 2,000 people, and I did everything, disciplinary actions, Freedom of Information Act questions, drafted legislation, wrote testimony, um, dealt with, wrote MOUs, dealt with other agencies. I did just about, I ran the gamut. I did just about everything. All right. And then in July 2006, you were contacted by a special agent uh, from the Inspector General's office. Uh, tell me about that. Well, on July 2006, I happened to be at the training academy. There was an arson investigator there named Hugh Fox, and he was there to take our records. And he there was doing an investigation of who was certified and who was not certified uh, as EMTs and um, in the CPR. And was this when you learned that Sergeant Phil Proctor was under investigation? Uh, a few days later, um, um, Chief Fleming, who was then the fire marshal, came up to me and started telling me that um, Sergeant Proctor was under investigation for allegedly allowing um, wow. cheating in one of the, um, one of the um, arson investigations training classes. Okay, and then in January 2007, you were approached by an assistant U.S. attorney conducting a criminal investigation uh, into arson uh, investigations. An unrelated matter, though, right? It was actually um, fire inspectors. Fire inspectors, Who right. are in the same division, but they perform, perform different functions. Gotcha. Okay. And, uh, and did you speak with the assistant U.S. attorney at that time? Yes, I did. And in March 2007, then you were called to a meeting by the interim fire chief? Brian Lee. Yeah, and what was that about? Well, Brian Lee was there, and as was Sergeant Phil Proctor. Um, and basically, it was to yell at me because he said I had incorrectly told the U.S. Attorney that Sergeant Proctor was under investigation by the OIG. Yeah. And he said he knew, he talking to the OIG, and he knew that investigation had been closed. And were you instructed to do anything? He instructed me not ever to talk to anybody outside the agency about anybody in the agency without going through him, and specifically not to talk to the OIG, the OAG, the U.S. Attorney. Office of Attorney General, OAG, oh. OIG, Office of Inspector General. About Sergeant Proctor. Okay. Now, you're a lawyer. <laughs> Is it legal to instruct you to do that? No. I knew that when he told me that. 
Okay. And when you raise these issues uh, with the chief, what happened? Well, Chief, chief Brian Lee left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tried to. He did not want to hear anything bad about Chief Lee. Mm -hmm. Chief Rubin, that is. Chief Rubin, the new chief, did yeah. not want to hear anything about the past chief. Okay. And then on June 8, 2007, you had a direct confrontation with Chief Lee? Yes, I did. And yeah. I told him for the first time, because I hadn't told him before, that I had disobeyed his order and checked with the Office of the Inspector General about the status of the investigation and was still ongoing. And, I, and he said to me when I said, I know you lied about the proctor's investigation, he looked at me and he said, is this being recorded? I said no, <laughs> and it's like he looked, you know, he looked relieved, and and um, he did not deny it, and then started telling me he was an ethical person, and nobody had ever said he was an unethical person, and I said, I, you know, at this point I have no choice because no one will do anything about it. And then six days later, you were removed as general counsel. Yes. And uh, were you uh, transferred within the office of the attorney general? I was detailed. Detailed mm -hmm. to do what? To work in the Office of the Legal Counsel Division, mm -hmm. and um, they do review mayor's orders, legislation, write legal opinions. It's kind of like a think tank mm -hmm. kind of place. Is that where you are now? No. Where are you now? I'm at the Department of Public Works mm -hmm. in a non legal position. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was an investigation of Sergeant Proctor, is that right? And Which what was, was the result of that? He was found um, to have lacked candor in the investigation, so to have violated um, personnel rules. Okay. Um, and I should say uh, that you filed a whistleblower claim in this case, and Captain Coleman has filed a whistleblower claim as well, and now we're going to turn our attention uh, to Fire Inspector uh, Pennington, who is also the author of a whistleblower claim, and we're going to find out why now. Um, when did you join the fire department? I'm in August of uh, 1991. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the last eight years, you've been an arson investigator? Yes, since okay. 2001. Okay. And is it an arson investigator a fireman or a cop? Um, we have law enforcement powers. So what does that mean? mean? Um, that means that we have we have full arrest powers to um, take someone's you know arrest, testify in court, surveillance, um, the whole law enforcement. So gamut. you carry a gun? Yes, mm -hmm. we carry weapons. Okay, and uh, how well did you do with this? You ever win any honors? Yes, I did. Uh, we received uh, well. When I say we, uh, my partner and I, uh, Investigator Boyer, we received uh, I believe it was 2005. Um, and uh, law enforcement achievement award from the U.S. Attorney's Office that recognize uh, top law enforcement uh, detectives and agents and officers from across the country is their involvement in different cases. And this was the first um, that a arson that a few arson cases were recognized at that national level. In 2007, there was an arson in in D.C., a very well known case where an historic uh, market, the Eastern Market, burned down near Capitol Hill. You weren't an investigator on that case, were you? I wasn't. Uh, I did not respond the day of to do the origin and cause, which is to determine how the fire started and where. But subsequently, we were um, commissioned or ordered um, from Chief Rubin through Palmer for Sergeant Proctor to put together a team of, of members from the unit to do some surveillance to look for a suspect because the citizens in, I think that's, uh, that's the, uh, the first district were complaining to the commander there that these fires had increased in activity and in amounts in that area since the Eastern Market Fire. So they forwarded over to the fire department and of course it came downhill. Sergeant Proctor put together a few of us. He created an ops plan and objectives, the goals, resignate, radio designations, pictures of Eastern Market, the other target areas, and we were looking for a suspect who was going around committing these fires in the alleys behind these businesses. Now, Chief Rubin thought, at least initially, that it was just uh, an accidental electrical fire, didn't he? Yes, he did. Uh, what did you find in, through your investigation? Well, um, we, we, most of the chatter and the, the individuals that we talked to, some of the firefighters from just being in that area, 
that when they first arrived on the scene that the fire was in the dumpster and it was only approximately maybe three quarters of the way up the back of the building at that time. It had not uh, reached the roof line. And what does that tell you? That the fire had originated in or around the dumpster. Mm -hmm. And is that suspicious or not suspicious or what? Uh, being a layperson, I don't know if that suggests arson or not. Um, well, it doesn't totally suggest arson. Um, it, ex it does suggest that... Um, it wasn't an electrical fire. It, it, it most likely may not have been. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there was an alcohol, tobacco, and firearms investigation of this fire as well, as I understand, federal agency. What did they find? Yes, the ATF report um, that we uh, got information on is they, they brought out an electrical in engineer and he determined that the d there was a trash compactor near the dumpster, that it was um, sustained some burning and oxidation as a result of the fire and not the cause of the fire itself. Mm -hmm. So the initial investigation, do you think it was good, botched, what? Uh, it was definitely botched. Okay. And uh, did you remain silent about that? No, we began to ask questions um, immediately because we had a junior member, not even a member, they had a detailed firefighter assigned as the lead investigator. And then the lieutenant of the unit at that time hadn't gone to any fire investigation training. He was heading up the investigation. There wasn't a call back. They didn't call in any of the senior members to come in to assist. They did call for the task force, which consists of two MPD officers, Metropolitan Police, and a few ATF agents. But out of that unit, maybe one or two of the agents are certified fire investigators. The police officers or the detectives are not. Mm -hmm. And they conducted canvases, and I think, and, 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 and got going. And what was told, well, what we saw on the television is Ruben was give Chief Ruben, um, was giving a press conference that it was an electrical fire, but yet they had not gone in the building yet. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you spoke out, was, was there any consequences to you of that? Absolutely. Well, it, be, it, was, it, was, it became a year and a half or two-year attack. And you literally, literally landed in the doghouse, is that right? Absolutely. Tell they, us about that. Well, as time progressed through all of the many uh, attacks on my partner and I, um, they converted the law enforcement office, which had the Wells NCIC computer access there. Um, they took the, disconnected the computer, put it in their a smaller office or room that housed the two canines, and in which that's where we were to conduct our investigations and do paperwork. Okay, and you've since been transferred, though, to the community service unit. What do you do there? Well, the community service unit started out as uh, reassigned, rather. Uh, we uh, were checking fire hydrants around the city. Mm -hmm. What, to see if there had been dogs present? or <laughs> <laughs> No, just to just open the fire hydrant to see if water uh, comes out, how far it comes out from the, the opening. Would you consider this a promotion? Absolutely not. And it's not a unique opportunity, <laughs> as the fire department will tell you. <laughs> Uh, and so what's your current status? What's the current status of your case? Um, the current status of our case is it, it is in um, U.S. District Court. Um, we're still in the preliminary stages. Um, the, the city filed a motion to dismiss, which um, we're still waiting to see if that's going to happen. Um, they missed a couple of extensions that we granted them and believe the judge finally, um, you know, ordered them to get their reply in, you know, uh, by midnight of the 22nd, in which they fail to do. Okay. Reflecting on your own cases and that of your colleagues here and other people you know at the fire department, uh, what is your current assessment of the DC fire department management and what needs to be done in order to reform the situation? We're on the siege. <laughs> We're on the siege by, um, I feel, management <clears throat> that do not have the best interests of the department or its employees um, at, the for, for, at the forefront. And um, I feel that there's a lack of, huge lack of uh, accountability with the management of the department. And they fail to obey their own policies. Yeah, I agree with Vanessa. They, 
think the rules don't apply to them, none of them. And um, they'll get angry if you tell them the rule applies to them. <laughs> so um, no dissent, no dissent is allowed of any kind. Absolutely. Well, um, in my situation, well, in my occupation, their um, egregious acts come out of them being firefighters and me being law enforcement, but yet they still view me as a firefighter. So when they ask you to do, or they ask your opinion on certain legal issues of what you can and cannot do, then they won't adhere to it. And what, you know, I mean, such as a, examples of changing reports to fit a confession, <laughs> which we told them you can't do, uh, turning over notes and any documents, uh, e electronic or written, that's considered jinx. Um, they won't do that. Um, considered jinx. Um, that's material that you must turn over as discoverable items. Um, jinx material. Occur. Jinx material. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's, it's, they definitely, um, it's very interesting what is happening now because mm -hmm. when you do speak out against them or if someone feels that, wow, you're getting a little too, you know, beyond your, yourself, then they start these inward attacks. And, and in my case, they really couldn't conjure up anything on us until we made an arrest in this last case, which is also in our lawsuit that involved uh, a juvenile over in the Northeast. Okay, so you now have about 30 seconds to tell uh, the D.C. City Council and Mayor what should happen. What, what needs to happen? The fire chief needs to be removed as well as his uh, immediate cabinet. Aye. They, they um, bring upon false charges against individuals, which I was just released of mine on yesterday. The attorney general's office decided that they were not going to go forward and prosecute because the fire department had given them incorrect information. I agree wholeheartedly. Accountability. And it needs to start at the top. All right. Well, many thanks to Gerald Pennington, Teresa Cusick, and Vanessa Coleman for joining us today and for your courage in speaking out about abusive and dangerous practices in the D.C. Fire Department. When we return, the legal and psychological impacts in ordering employees to take fitness for duty tests. Welcome back to Whistle Where You Work. As we just heard, employer retaliation for blowing the whistle takes a variety of forms, but one of the most sinister is to treat the dissenter as a crazy. That sends a message to fellow workers and isolates and undermines the employee. In the old Soviet Union, they shipped dissenters off to sanitariums. Here we have due process rights before you can be placed in a mental hospital, but that doesn't keep employers from playing the crazy card. They instead ship dissenters off to fitness for duty psychological exams. Employee advocates raised a stink about this and it was stopped at the federal government level, but as we heard in the Vanessa Coleman firefighter case, it still goes on in state and local governments and in the private sector. With us to discuss the legal and psychological implications of this practice are GAP Senior Litigation Counsel Richard Condit, and psychotherapist Dr. Donald Sokin of Integrity International. Welcome to Whistle Where You Work. Hello. Richard, Hello. let's start with you. How frequent, how common are these um, orders to employees to uh, report to a fitness uh, for duty ex psychological exam? Well, unfortunately, Mark, they're not uncommon. Um, they occur both at the federal level, uh, usually related to military or military installations, as well as uh, we saw in the, in the previous uh, segment at the local level or state level, in this case the District of Columbia 
And uh, they're often used, uh, as we see, with dissenters when those dissenters cannot be handled in another way. The fitness for duty psychological is a great way for an employer to unilaterally take action to try to check that person's dissent. Now, doesn't it make sense when you have, uh, for certain very sensitive positions, to require an employee to take a psychological exam to make sure that they're stable and that they can handle the pressure of the job? Well, it absolutely does. Uh, the problem is, though, that if a person has already been performing adequately and there has been no indication of some kind of problem, um, there should be a mechanism by which a manager has to go through steps to establish that an action to be taken in, in submitting someone to a psychological examination is warranted. In the case of uh, Captain Coleman, who we heard in the previous segment, uh, there doesn't seem to be uh, any steps that an official has to take in the D.C. Fire Department. They can simply order you to do it. If you don't do it, then you're insubordinate. If you're insubordinate, then action can be taken against you. Don, what's the impact on the employee when they're subjected to these fitness for duty exams? Well, I think that uh, it is certainly a damage. And when, when I do my um, psychological reports, I uh, point out how this has damaged their, their complete life. The, uh, if, you were, if you're the pers kind of a person that most whistleblowers are, that you are an absolutist, that there, there's a definite right and wrong, and you are then, you do that, you do the right thing, and then after that you are, um, you are harassed, you are intimidated, you are um, forced, demoted, even forced retirement. This is, a, this is a catastrophe on the part of the individual, that everything that they have been taught up to that point to tell the truth and do the right thing. They learn the hard way that there are places where telling the truth uh, does not work. And so they, they become very depressed generally. And what is the message that's sent to coworkers by subjecting someone to a fitness for 2D exam? First of all, do they know about it happening? And if they do, what, what do they take away from that? Well, as I said, this is a very private area that a person's life and their and their personal thoughts and ideas should be private. What happens in an agency, in a, in a corporation, many times, this is made a public event. There is the, um, uh, people start talking, the grapevine picks it up, and then you have the person, uh, all of the private things that a person has inside of them that they don't want to tell anybody gets exposed. The message then is, if you don't keep your mouth shut, we're going to get you. Richard, in a situation where an employer wants to take some kind of retaliatory action against an employee, uh, the burden might be on the employer to show the justification for it. But I'm wondering, in a fitness for duty context, if it doesn't, uh, in effect, flip the burden that the uh, employee now is placed on the defensive and has to prove not that what they said was true, but that they're sane. Uh, that's absolutely correct, uh, Mark. The, once the order is given, uh, the onus then becomes on the employee to prove something that they shouldn't have to prove. And that was what I was alluding to earlier in my point about process. There should be some kind of process, some kind of check and balance before a untrained official who has an ax to grind should be allowed to order to someone to engage in such a sensitive process. In the case of Captain Coleman and the fire department, that process is before you even get to the point of enduring the psychological evaluation, you have to sign a waiver form that waives all of your rights. And the waiver form does not even allow you to get a copy of whatever report or analysis the psychologist does. So you're ordered to take the exam you have to sign a waiver saying that you waive all of your rights in taking the exam. Are you allowed to refuse to take the exam? According to the fire department, you are not. If you, if you refuse in any way, if you refuse even to sign the waiver, you are considered insubordinate and you're placed on charges. Well, aren't waivers supposed to be voluntary? <laughs> well, I think the fire department uh, doesn't know a lot about uh, contract and acceptance and consideration because uh, I believe that's, uh, that's an absolute absolutely legitimate issue. Uh, you cannot have situations where people are being oppressed and being unfairly treated and have them expect to have executed 
uh, legal consent in those circumstances. So what are the consequences for an employee who refuses to be uh, tested? If you refuse to be tested in the context of the D.C. Fire Department, uh, as with Captain Coleman, uh, you are basically placed on charges for refusing and you are brought before a uh, trial board of uh, basically officers from the fire department and in which case they will judge you guilty or innocent and then met out a, a discipline. In Captain Coleman's case, uh, her refusals are turning into a um, approach at discipline which would seek her termination. Don, you'd recommend nonetheless that employees try to resist being sent to these fitness for duty exams, is that right? Yes, the, uh, the problem is that the non-psychological person, the, 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 the um, employer, is making the decision that this person is crazy. They then ask the psychiatrist or psychologist or social worker to determine whether they're fit for duty. It's all completely backwards. This is an issue you've been raising for a long time now. And in January of 1984, I guess a seminal year for government intrusion, we actually, at the federal level, uh, became less intrusive. What was that? The, in 1984, after a, a number of hearings and a long period of uh, reevaluation. These would be federal congressional hearings. The federal uh, executive branch blocked the idea of anybody, you could not force a federal employee to take the exam. This did not apply to, to the legislative branch. In about uh, 1990, it became, oh, I became aware of some cases in the, in the legislative branch at the Library of Congress. I asked the union to give me the, the uh, cases in a list of cases. Uh, I took the cases, they were not identified by individuals, but took the cases to Connie Mack, who was a senator from Florida, and he looked this over and he couldn't believe it and he said we are going to do the same thing as executive branch. So that was stopped. Well, many thanks to Dr. Donald Sokin and Richard Condit for walking us through the world of psychological testing of dissenting employees. It's past time to blow the whistle on this insidious practice. I'm Mark Cohen and this has been Whistle Where You Work.